July 2019 saw a couple of important anniversaries, the 21st of July being the 50th anniversary of man first walking on the moon, and the 1st of July, well, that was the 40th anniversary of the first Sony Walkman. But what if I could show you something that connects those two things together? And it's kept inside this rather ominous looking black box. Okay, let's lift the lid on this one. You are looking at a Sony TC50 cassette recorder, a marvel of miniaturization from 1968. It really doesn't look unusually small nowadays, but this really was quite the feat of engineering a full decade before the first Sony Walkman. The TC50 was the smallest cassette recorder at the time, and when combined with the easy-to-load Philips compact cassettes, it made the ideal tape recorder to accompany the astronauts on the Apollo missions. And in May 1969, a TC50 orbited the moon on Apollo 10. Now, if you've seen the film First Man, you'll have briefly seen a Sony TC50 floating around the spacecraft playing music. I've got no idea how much this set cost back in the day, but you can tell that it certainly wasn't cheap. Just look at this inspection card, signed with care by three people. Now, I imported this set from Japan, and it also contains the original accessories, including a cassette tape in a cardboard box. There's nothing of historical interest on the tape, though. The interest here lies in the TC50 and its place in history. It's got an interesting three-button control system where the middle push button changes its function depending upon the position of the play lever. In the stop position, the button activates rewind. But when the tape's playing, holding it down will play the tape forward at double speed. Recording is achieved by holding down the red button whilst also moving the lever into the play position, which is marked on this machine as forward. And there's also a record level indicator, which doubles as a battery monitor. And importantly, these simple controls could be operated easily, even whilst wearing gloves, which came in handy. On the reverse side is a speaker, and notice how Sony were referring to the cassette at this point as the Magazine-matic, a term that's also used on the box, along with their preference to use the word tape corder rather than the more common tape recorder, a practice that they continued to follow for years. There's a built-in microphone on the side of the machine, something that was unusual at this time when most mics were kept separate on a wire to avoid picking up motor noise. The TC50, in comparison, was designed to be a tape recorder that you could use in one hand. One thing that's sadly missing from my set, though, is the original NiCad battery pack. Ironically, when I bought this earlier in the year, that battery wasn't permitted to fly from Japan to the UK, and yet 50 years ago, one went to the moon. That's progress for you. It wouldn't have been much use nowadays anyway, though, but it would have been nice to keep the whole set complete. The volume control is marked PB Vol to show it only affects the playback and not the record level. These two plastic stoppers at the top are what the door rests on when it's open, and there's very little plastic in this machine. All the cassette compartment is made out of metal. There's a strip of velvet along the bottom, though, over the head cover, and that's there to ensure that when the spring-loaded door is closed, it does so silently. It's this kind of attention to detail that shows the care that went into putting this together. Above the wrist strap on the side, we've got the DC power input that I'll be using later on. We've got an earphone output, and then at the top, we've got a microphone input with a remote control socket. I've got the microphone here, of course, and you can see that it's a beautiful, minimalist 1960s design. Now, when this plugs into the machine, it plugs into both the mic and the remote sockets, which means that the switch on the front of the mic is able to start and stop the machine recording. And if you'd like that same functionality to be able to start and stop the recorder easily, but whilst using the built-in microphone, then you can plug this accessory into the side, which effectively acts like a pause button. Given that this is approximately 50 years old, it should come as no surprise that it isn't working. This is something I knew when I bought it. I really just got it to show as a non-functional, proper, historic object. But I decided to try and see if I could get it to play a tape as well. So I downloaded the service manual to see how it came apart and bought it a new belt. The disassembly instructions were incredibly brief, just listing the screws that needed to be removed. A total of two from the control panel, one from the lever and four from the cover. Now, once that cover was removed, I really did expect to be able to see the belt, but it turns out there was still quite some way to go. This thing is packed in like a sandwich of tightly crammed together components. It looks like every millimetre of internal space has been put to some use. 
The only other screws mentioned in the disassembly guide were the two holding the head cover in place, but removing those didn't get me any closer to the belts, obviously. The only remaining screws left that I could see were on the back plate, but after removing all four of those, I found this didn't lead anywhere either. I'd have to approach things from the other side by finding some way to remove that circuit board and get underneath it. Now, under the plastic film that covers the circuit board, I found two screws that went through it, and then there was another screw attached to a metal bracket. But even with those removed, the board still refused to budge. Now, after much head scratching, I decided to try peeling back that leather look cover from the side and found another three concealed screws that weren't mentioned anywhere in that service manual. So, yeah, thanks for that. So what you've just watched in two minutes approximately occurred over the course of about an hour. But finally I could get to the belt and whilst it was a very tight squeeze I was able to extract the old one and put the new one in its place. Now I've got to point out that the belt is the least of this machine's troubles. All the components in here are well beyond their specified number of years they should be working for. Well I'd imagine they are. I mean it's amazing anything's working in here at all but it is barely functioning. Putting the power in I'm getting the things moving around as they should do but the speed tends to slow down after a while and speed up again. It probably needs all new capacitors. In fact it needs all new everything but I'm not going to do all that because really this thing should just be enjoying its retirement inside a glass case. I just wanted to show it functioning one final time but you've got to bear in mind that the sound quality on this is not going to be what it would have been when this thing was new. It's amazing it's still doing anything. One thing I often see criticism of is Sony's insistence on using centre negative on their barrel plug connectors, but it's handy for me because this more modern adapter can power this older device. And also it shows that they've been using this setup for 50 years now, so perhaps we should have got used to it by now. Now I didn't record anything on this because it barely works long enough for me to be able to demonstrate these sections here but you can see how the microphone operates the machine remotely as does the little add-on remote control on the side but if I wanted to record something on a tape recorder I'm not going to be using this I've got a couple of other machines in the house that I could use instead this is more of a collector's piece but you've seen how all the functions would have worked when it was new but now let's compare it against the Sony Walkman that came along a decade later. You can see the family resemblance, however the Walkman is noticeably lighter as well as being a little bit thinner. Now of course Sony didn't just jump from 1968's TC50 to 1979's TPSL2 Walkman. Now after the TC50, other handheld recorders followed, like this TC55 from 1972 that adds in a tape counter, more recognisable controls, as well as incorporates that remote start-stop button into the body and drops the name Magazine-Matic in favour of the more familiar cassette corder. Then there's 1978 TCM600, which looks uncannily like the first Walkman. And if you know the story behind the creation of the Walkman, then you'll know why that is. The founder of Sony, who by the late 1970s had the position of honorary chairman, enjoyed listening to his music cassettes while he travelled. He did this by attaching headphones to the stereo Sony TCD5 portable. However, this was a bulky setup, so one day he asked the engineers if they could come up with something a little bit smaller. The engineers took their latest Pressman record aka the TCM600, which had come out in 1978. They removed the recording circuitry and speaker, upgraded the tape head and amplification circuitry to stereo, and so the first Walkman prototype was born. The following year, the first commercial Walkman was brought to market, accompanied by new lightweight headphones, but they didn't really expect to sell many because they thought who, other than their chairman, would be interested in a cassette player that couldn't record. This initial reticence explains the minimal redesign from the TCM600. They just didn't want to put too much effort into engineering something that might be a flop. That Walkman, though, and all the others that follow, owe their existence to Sony's range of handheld recorders that date back to 1968's revolutionary TC50. This book about Sony's designs mentions an interesting fact about the TC50. 
When Sony were coming up with a design for their first handheld cassette recorder, they chose to make the shape of it echo the shape of the cassette. This 1960s decision to mimic the proportions of the cassette in the machine that the cassette goes in is a decision that shaped the look of the Walkman and was one that carried on being mirrored in machines for decades to come. We become so accustomed to the shape of a Walkman, it's something you're never likely to have given a second thought. And of course, yes, in later years, it was all about making the smallest possible machine that could still hold a tape inside it. But back when they started out, they did have a choice. They could have gone in a different direction, as demonstrated by this Philips DCC machine, which doesn't attempt to mimic the shape of a DCC, perhaps deliberately as a way to differentiate itself from these standard cassette Walkmans. One of the Sony TC50s that travelled on Apollo 12 is now an exhibit in the Smithsonian. My machine, on the other hand, is kept in a black box on a shelf. Mine didn't really do anything significant, well, other than do its little bit in helping to kick off a personal audio revolution. So please feel free to file this video under tenuous links, as well as someone trying to cash in on an anniversary of a historic event. However, I really did think it was interesting that 40 years ago this came out, and 50 years ago one of these went to the moon. But that is it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Did you know that man never set foot on the moon? Oh no, you're not one of those conspiracy clowns, are you? I'm sick to death of all these blimmin' idiots nowadays. No, that's not what I meant. Just because they can't put their trousers on without falling over, they think it's impossible for anyone else to do anything more complicated. No, I was just saying. And have you ever thought it's weird how these conspiracy theorists won't believe the experts, but they'll put 100% trust in what one bloke posts on his MySpace page. No, honestly, I'm not one of those. What I meant was that the astronauts who landed on the moon were wearing boots. Why does that matter? Well, everyone's saying that it's 50 years since man set foot on the moon, but their feet never touched the moon's surface. They actually set boot on the moon. OK, so let's bring this back down to Earth. You told me earlier on that it's 10 years since you went to New York, right? Yeah. Did you walk around there in your bare feet? What? No, I'm not crazy. I'd rather lick the screen of a smartphone that I found in a cruise ship's toilet. Well then, by your logic, you've never set foot in New York. True, but I did breathe in the air, eat the food, and interact with the friendly locals. They didn't do any of those things on the moon. No, you're right. And they didn't even take the subway. Exactly. Right, hold on. Let me take my shoes and socks off. Why? Well, I'm going to set foot in your kitchen for the first time ever. 
because up till now, I've only ever been in there with my shoes on. And apparently, that no longer counts. So, this is going to be a whole new experience. Okay, while you're in there, can you put the kettle on? This is one small... A flipping egg. What's up? The dog's been sick on the floor. I wish I'd kept my shoes on. Whose stupid idea was this? <laughs>